Bible, turn with me to 1 John. We're going to be in 1 John 1 and 1 John 2 this morning. I know we wrapped up 1 John 1 last week, but we're going to bounce back because we've got to talk about what we talked about already and what we're talking about today. So, to start off this morning, I'm going to ask you some questions. And the first question is, is what does Jesus mean to you? What does Jesus mean to you? And I don't want you to give me your favorite Sunday school answer when you think about it. I want, to think, I want you to look at your own life and where is Jesus in, in your life? Where do you see him? Where is, his, like, where is he on your priority list? Where do you place Jesus? Like, what noticeable difference, if any at all, does Jesus make in your life? And is he supposed to make a difference in your life? Is there a difference because you know who Jesus is, you're a follower of Jesus? Do I have a relationship with Jesus? Is Jesus more than today even, coming to church, singing some songs of worship to him, and maybe giving some money, some of those kind of things? Is it more than that? And this all leads to my main question here this morning is, is how do I know I know Jesus? How do I know that, that I know him? See, this is a question that people have asked me throughout ministry, like in the past, like, how do I know? They want to know if they really know Jesus. And is there a difference in knowing about Jesus and actually knowing Jesus? And, and I really believe that there is a difference. Uh, and, and, and so can we really get to know Jesus? And yes, again, I really believe that we can. And one of the main purposes of this book, this letter that, that John writes here, sorry, let me adjust this real quick. One of the main purposes that, that John is writing this, this letter to this, these church, this church is, is that you and I, might know that we are truly children of God. That we would know for sure, that we'd have an assurance to know that we are born again, that we've been changed by Jesus. And the Bible plainly teaches that it's possible for a follower of Jesus to really know that they are truly saved, that you are a child, you are a son or daughter of God. In fact, it would have been really inconceivable to go back into the, if we were in the first century, and we were to ask those Christians who were, you know, if they knew, if they, if they knew, they knew Jesus. If they were actually a follower, like, do they really personally know him? And I don't think, and I don't think we would get answers like, well, I hope so, or I think I am. Those early Christians had an assurance because their salvation was solidly based on a real experience with the Lord Jesus Christ and the unshakable testimony of what they had in the Word of God. And so John is now really getting to the point, the theme of this letter that he's writing here, and he's starting to talk about the assurance that we have as followers of Jesus as Christians. How can we know that we are His? And so... In these verses, we're going to see him repeat this phrase, those that say, those that say. And John is taking the theme that you know that you know God by putting it into a personal areas of our lives. He's like, he's taking this and he's bringing it home to us, really. So this is John's main point throughout this letter. And so today we're going to be talking about, in this, how do we deal with guilt and shame and condemnation in our lives. Because John is saying in this book, one of the main purposes here is that you would have joy. It's what we began to talk about last week. That's like one of his main purposes. He wants us to have joy. So, he started that off back in chapter 1, verse 5. And he doesn't talk about us and our flaws in chapter 1, verse 5. But he starts with God and God's character, who God is. And he tells us, if you remember from last week, that God is light. God is light. This means that God is pure. And the problem is, is that God is light, and as for us, there's, we have darkness. John starts with us, or she, excuse me, John starts with God, not with us. 
That's where he starts. And that's what the, the Bible does as well, right? You open up the Bible, you get to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the first four words of the Bible, what are they? In the beginning, God. And the rest of the Bible is God revealing himself to us, showing us who he is. That's what it is. And so um, we have to see then that God is the hero and we are not. God is the main character and we are not. And if you're going to understand your life, you have to start with God. If you're going to want, if you want joy in your life, you have to start with God. And so John says the problem is, is what we do is we turn to ourselves. We look to ourselves. And so instead of God being the hero, we make ourselves the hero. And John tells us that's darkness. So chapter one, God is light and humans have darkness. And we have to deal with that. Chapter 2, John is writing this so that we don't sin. So go back to chapter 1, verse 8 real quickly. We looked at a little bit last week. In chapter 1, verse 8, it says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And then drop down to verse 10. It says, If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now go to chapter 2, where we're going to spend most of our time today, and verse 1. And he says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So, John, what he's saying here is, is I don't want you to think that you are without sin, and I don't want you to sin even though I know you're going to sin. Now that sounds really confusing, doesn't it? He's saying, I don't want you to think that you're without sin, but I don't want you to sin even though you're going to sin. Now, this is not an issue with God being confused here, but it's an issue with humans being complicated. And so the Bible tells us that we are flesh and we are spirit. Now, the flesh, that's not, well, he's not talking about this here, our skin, right? The flesh is that part of us as followers of Jesus that we have not yet submitted to him. It's a part of us that we haven't submitted to God. So, for those that have allowed Jesus to be their Savior, we've trusted in Him to be our Savior and what He did for us, His life, His death on the cross, and His resurrection. The Spirit is that beautiful part of us that is submitted to God. And there's a war that's going on inside of us. Flesh and spirit are battling. And the flesh is actually hostile to God. The flesh is powerful. And in spite of how powerful the flesh really is, it, um, John is saying to us, I don't want you to sin. Have you ever tried not to sin? How'd that go for you? Right? Like, uh, we think that if we're not going to sin, that it's on us, that we have to do this thing, that we have to be strong, that we have to keep ourselves from sin. Look at verse 1 again, chapter 2. He says, My little children, I am writing these things that you may not sin. Go down to verse 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. We're going to unpack this here in a minute, but we have, then we have all of, I want to just show us some other verses that we see throughout the Bible. These, these verses like 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It says, so my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Philippians chapter 3 Verse 12, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on, one, on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. And then we have Hebrews chapter 12. Playing a game of tag. 
Hebrews 12 says, Work at living at peace with everyone and work at living a holy life, for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. And 1 John 2, 6, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And well, well, that's part of our passage today in our verses, but I put it up on the screen since we're going through all those other verses. But these verses, these are, these are great verses here. And we can take these verses and we can use them with the idea that, that I can just grit it out and that I can work it out so that I won't sin anymore in my life. And you know, that might work for a little while. But if it's all on us, to keep ourselves from sinning, we can move so dangerously close to falling into legalism, or we can just fall into legalism. We can apply legalism to our obedience. And we've talked about legalism in the past, but I want to just give us a reminder here this morning. Maybe I don't. Uh, Hopefully, if you have it in your notes, this is what legalism means. Legalism is when it comes to our obedience with God is when you focus on and you credit our obedience as the main source of our holiness. So, I try to do a bunch of good things so God will approve me. That's what legalism is. If I can just do all of these things, then God will be happy with me. He won't be angry with me, and I'm on his team. That's what it does. And the problem is, is that if you succeed in this, you are going to be arrogant and prideful. And then you're going to judge everybody around you who doesn't match and reach up to your levelness of holiness. And you're like, why didn't they get there? Why couldn't they do what I did and pull themselves up and be really good? And you're going to be, you're going to be, you're going to, you're going to put them down. Now, if you fail at this, you're condemned because your whole standing with God is on your obedience and on your performance. And so when you mess up, you think, oh man, God must be angry with me. He might not love me anymore. And legalism at times sounds good, and it almost helps you to avoid sin in your life. It kind of empowers you to obey, but the problem is it's self-effort and it's self-righteousness. Trying not to sin will not last for you. If you're going to try it, it's not going to last. It ultimately won't last. So what John wants to do is he wants to give us a different motive here. And he gets, he says like, well, it's time to get your eyes off of yourself and get your eyes on God. Focus on God. Go back to verse one. We're going to read the whole thing this time. It says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So John is telling us that Jesus is our advocate. Now, the closest thing that we have to an advocate today is an attorney. So when you think about an advocate being like an attorney, don't think of like an attorney who tries to get their client off on a technicality. Think of a good lawyer who is arguing based on the merits of the case. Now that's close to what an advocate is, but it's really not what an advocate is, okay? Because the advocate, an advocate doesn't argue based on the merits of the case. The advocate argues based on the merits of themselves, okay? So that's why John says that Jesus Christ, the one and only true righteous one, is the advocate. He's basing the case on who Jesus is, okay? So an advocate is a legal proxy, someone who stands in for you and who has an official relationship with you or to you, okay? So that you achieve whatever that person achieves as your legal representative. That's what an advocate is. This is who Jesus is for us. He is our advocate. This means that he stood in. He represented us. He represented you on the cross. So our sins were transferred to him. And so he was treated as if we we were him so that we could be treated as if he were us. He represented us on the cross. And then, that's what he did on the cross. But now... He represents us as our advocate. This is who he is. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, 
it says therefore he is able once and forever to save those who come to god through him he lives forever to intercede with god on their behalf and romans 8 34 who is to condemn christ jesus is the one who died more than that, he was, who, who was raised, who was at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. He's praying for us. So Jesus is living now, right? He died on the cross, but three days later, he rose again to life. He's in heaven, and he's praying for us. He's alive now, praying for us. So when you're in the middle of temptation, Jesus is praying for you. When you're in a mess, Things are going crazy in your life. Jesus is praying for you. When you're struggling with things and maybe even sin in your life, Jesus is praying for you. When people don't understand what's happening and what's going on in your life, and maybe they're coming against you in some ways, and they just don't see the picture, Jesus is praying for you. He is your advocate. He is your intercessor. He is lifting you up before God the Father, and he's doing that right now. Jesus is the one who is speaking to the Father in your defense, in my defense. And he isn't saying, Father, oh, just go easy on them. You have no idea what it's like for them down there. Jesus isn't asking for mercy. He isn't begging for leniency for us who are followers of Jesus. What he's doing is he's demanding justice. Now, remember last week, we looked at verse 9 in chapter 1. Go back to chapter 1, verse 9. It says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. He's not, quote, coerced into this. He asks the Father for justice. He's saying, Father, you can't hold these sins against them because I've already paid for them on the cross. Now, when you think about this all happening up in heaven and, and Jesus and God maybe having these conversations and, and this, there isn't a war going on between God the Father and God the Son. Okay, that's not what's happening. But this is about what is right and just. And so... Jesus isn't asking the Father to overlook our sin or to forget our sin. Jesus is there to remind him that the debt has already been paid and punishment has already happened for that. And so as God's children, we are free because Jesus died for us. And God would be unjust if he didn't forgive my sin. Jesus died for me. God's acceptance of us is a matter of justice. I don't know about you, but I think this is a little bit exciting. This is a good thing. And so when we are in Christ, our sins are utterly forgiven, forgotten. God literally does not hold them against us. So what enables this to happen? Why does this matter? Verse 2 tells us, chapter 2, verse 2. He is the propitiation of, for our sins... And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So he is our sacrifice. Somebody's reading theirs. Cool. So he is our sacrifice. In the Old Testament, God set up the sacrificial system. And the whole theme of the sacrificial system is the innocent is killed for the guilty. So God would tell them, what I want you to do is you're going to take an innocent, pure animal, and you're going to have the high priest kill that animal so that it would be on the behalf of the sins of the people. The high priest put that animal in the Holy of Holies at the mercy seat. And the animal was sacrificed for the sins of the people. That's what happened. And it turned God's wrath away from the sins of the people. And God wouldn't be just if he didn't punish people for their sins. And it's a hard thing for us to, to, to even think about and try to understand today. We don't like to think about that. But that's why John told us that God is light. People don't understand God's holiness. God would be unjust not to punish people for their sins. And so in the Old Testament, he sets up the sacrificial system so that there would be justice. In the New Testament, 
Jesus appeased the wrath of God the Father so that we could be reconciled to God. You see, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, it says, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So Jesus took our place. That's what He did. He took our place. God punished Jesus so that, we could, that He could bring us into His family. Jesus took God's wrath and anger for sin on Himself. And the cross isn't about Jesus pleading our innocence. The cross is about Jesus taking our guilt and punishment upon himself. He took it. And you may say, okay, well, that's great, but what does that matter when I'm really tempted to do something I know is wrong? Well, let me tell you, everything, it has to do with everything with it, okay? Everything that we've talked about has to deal with this. Why do I need an advocate? Like if it's legally done, if I'm clean, if I'm cleansed from my sin, why do I need an advocate? Well, here's why. It's because we have a prosecutor. And this prosecutor is after us. He's after you. He's after me. The Bible talks about that as followers of Jesus, we have three enemies in our lives. And so those enemies are the flesh, right? We've talked about that already. The flesh is not our skin, but the flesh is that part of us that's not yet submitted to God. We also have the world, and that is a bunch of people living in the part of them that is not yet submitted to God. And we are not in a battle against people, but we have a third enemy. And that third enemy is Satan, and his name means accuser. In fact, in Revelation chapter 12, tells us what Satan does. And it says there, for the accuser, and that's talking about Satan, for the accuser, excuse me, of the brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before God day and night. So Satan comes to us, and he whispers in our ears, and he says, oh, you'll never get over that thing. You're always going to struggle with this. Oh, your marriage is always going to stink. Your kids are, are never going to do what's right. That's what Satan does. He comes in and he says these things to us, and he's bringing up our failures, and he's bringing them into clarity in our minds. And he does it so that we'll get distracted from God and what he's doing in our lives. And so he works with the guilt, the shame, and the consequences of all of those things, and he brings them into clear focus in us, trying to tear us down, trying to bring us down. But this is why Jesus said in Luke chapter 22, he's talking to Peter, and he says, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat, but I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. And Jesus is saying to Peter, I already know that you're going to mess up here. I know you're going to sin, but I'm praying for you that after you sin, I'm assuring you that you have forgiveness and that you're going to make it through this whole thing. And so Satan, he's going to come and he's going to try to condemn you for this. And I'm telling you now all about this so that you will not listen to him, you will not listen to the voice of the condemner, so that you will be able to stand up against this and that you will be able to encourage and strengthen other people around you after it. And so we have this assurance that Jesus is praying for us the same way. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, we says, So there is now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And so these voices that you hear that maybe say to you that you're a liar, you're a loser, you're never, you're never going to make it out of this situation, you're always going to struggle with this the rest of your life, that is condemnation. And that has already been dealt with, those things. And here's the hard part about this, because when Satan says those things to us, you know what? He's right. Most of the things he brings up to us are true. He tries, does lie to us, but a lot of the things he brings up are true. And so it brings a response from us. And when we see our failure, like we can't ignore that. It hits us. And when we deal with our sin, we can't miss the gospel and go to something else. 
We can't listen to the voice of Satan, but we can't also go to something other than the gospel when we deal with this. And one wrong way to deal with it is something that we've already begun to talk about this morning, that's legalism. Legalism says you're really, really wicked, but you aren't totally accepted in Jesus, like you aren't totally accepted in him. And in legalism, you don't see Jesus as representing you before the Father. And what that does is it makes you try to work harder, to try to obey better. You try to be a perfect person. Or we can miss the gospel another way, and it's by taking God's grace and saying, I can do whatever I want. It doesn't matter because I'm going to be forgiven anyways. And in this, you see that you're really, really loved and accepted by God, but you don't see yourself as a need of God. You don't see yourself as, as sinful. You don't see the need for Jesus dying on the cross for you. You're not sinful. You're just trying to find yourself. And so if we give in to either of these, they will rob us of assurance and they will bury us in condemnation. So here's what a legalist does. They, ne they commit to never sinning that way ever again. I'll never do that again. Or I'm going to read my Bible every single day. And whatever it is that they're struggling with, they commit to, it's not going to happen. I'm never going to do that again. Have you ever said to yourself, I'll never do that again? And then there's failure, and then there's recommitment, and then you fail again. And that's when, it's, you, you, when what, then what starts happening is, it's like, oh, I'll never do this ever again. And then what happens is, is you start hiding your sin from everybody. You don't like, and, and you get really depressed. Like, you don't come to anybody to help. You don't want anybody to see you the way you are, and you get really depressed in your life. And that is a vast majority of people who go to church. They're people who are hiding what's going on in their lives, and they're so depressed about it. They're not finding any help. They're not finding any healing. The other side of this is, is that you reclassify it, and that's what we talked about last week, and you try to justify it in your mind. And before long, you don't even know what the truth is anymore. And so both of these things will bring condemnation into your life. Neither of them will silence the voice of guilt and, and, and they will never destroy shame. But what the gospel does, it's different than these two. The gospel says the reason that you're condemned or the way you feel guilt or shame is because you're using something other than Jesus as your hope, as your significance, as your meaning, or as we see today, as your advocate. You're using something other in your life than, other than Jesus. You're allowing something other than Jesus to speak to the Father for you. It could be a whole list of things. But really, it boils down to you're either using your own commitment to God to speak to Him, or you're using your freedom to speak to Him. And so we have to see ourselves as completely sinful, but also that we're totally accepted by God because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. That's what it is. That's what this is all about. Now, when you see your... Let me start over. When sin comes into your life, how do you respond because of these realities? Because of this truth we've seen this morning. Well, you have to realize that you're a bigger sinner than you ever thought you were. Like, I knew I was in trouble, but I'm really in trouble. And if you stay in that spot, though, that you see yourself as a bigger sinner than you ever thought you would, you'll go nuts, you'll go crazy. So you can't stay there. And though you are a bigger sinner than you ever thought you were, you also have to see that you have a bigger Savior than you ever thought you would have. Like, Jesus is big enough and dealt with all this stuff, and I need Him. He's the one I come to, and He did it for me. And since Jesus loves and forgave you in the middle of, uh, of all of that, what a Savior we have. And so from that, we remember we are totally accepted because of what Jesus has done for me. And yes, I wrestle with things, but I am accepted by Him. That's how you grow as a Christian. You realize your depravity, but you accept your acceptance. And you may say, well, that's great, but when I read the Bible, all I see is obey, 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 obey. All right. Chapter 2, verse 3. Let's look at that. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. And then verse 6 again. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. 
So, we are to live our lives as Jesus lived. Now, how did Jesus live? How did Jesus live? What motivated Jesus to be live in obedience? Well, John is trying to get us to look at, at what motivated him. Jesus obeyed his father like a child. He just trusted. He just trusted. So when your, your kids are little, they're small, they're tiny, they listen way more than when they become teenagers. Right? Have you noticed that? Those that have kids and they've gone that age. Little children just trust. And that's the way Jesus obeyed. And you see this at his baptism when he's anointed for ministry. God the Father spoke from heaven and said, You are my son in whom, you, whom I'm well pleased. I'm pleased in you. And so in my life, I knew that my parents loved me no matter what I did, you know, no matter what trouble I got into. I knew that they would be upset with me, but I knew that they still loved me. And that acceptance from them made me want to please them because they truly loved me. And they were my parents, and they cared for me and wanted the best for me. Do you know that about God for you? Because this is how obedience works. John is saying, get rid of all of your other advocates. Get rid of all the other things that speak for you. Whether it's your commitment, your religious activity, oh, you know, I, I, I'm reading the Bible every day, whatever it is, and accept your acceptance. Those things are good, but don't let those, don't use those things to speak for you. And just accept your acceptance. Stop letting other things or other people, uh, other than Jesus, stand in for you. Let Jesus be your advocate. When you allow him to be your advocate, that's the fuel for following him. Now go to verse 5 in chapter 2, and this ties it all together here. And it says, But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this way we know that we are in him. So it's not just obedience that brings assurance. It's obedience that's fueled by love that brings assurance. When we love Jesus more than anything else, it will make us want to follow him. Love awakens and empowers obedience. I obey because I am loved by him. Fear, if you have fear, like if I, don't me if I mess up, God's not, I don't know if God's going to love me. What fear does is that awakens and empowers legalism. I got to do better, try harder. And so I must obey or I'll lose God's love. That's what that does. That thought, kind of thinking will never help you follow God. What John is saying is, is, yes, we are to obey him, but get the right fuel to obey him. It's love that motivates obedience that gets our assurance that we're followers of him. So let's love Jesus and let's follow Jesus, not because we have to do that, but because we want to, because we know that he loves us and he wants what's best for us in our life. His way is right. And so we follow him out of that love that he has for us and our love for him. And that's where we see and know that we are truly his. Because we recognize his love, we realize that he is praying for us, interceding on our behalf and that he has done the work, and that we trust in him through faith, that we, he has dealt with our sin. It is done. Would you bow your heads this morning? And I don't know where you are today, Maybe you're wondering, does God really love me? Maybe you're wondering, am, am I really his? Have I done enough that I'm actually a Christian? And what we see here is that it's not about what we do. I'm trying to put out a good life to God. It's about what Jesus did for us. He stood in for us on the cross and all of our sin and all of our guilt and all of our shame fell upon him. 
And so we have what Jesus has now, his life. And that leads us to him. Because we see his love for us. It brings joy in our lives because we know that God loves us no matter what. And it leads us to follow him in his ways because we know that those are best for us. That's what motivates us, the love of Jesus and what he did for us. And maybe today you need to surrender again to that. Jesus, I've been trying so hard to prove to you how much I love you by doing all these things. And maybe those things are good things. But all that matters is what Jesus has done for you. Will you trust in that? Will you find joy in him? Will you just recognize the love that he has for you? And so as we close this morning... you don't feel that connection to Jesus, if you don't realize, you don't know if he really loves you, will you just trust Jesus this morning? And if you do know that, will you just rest in that today and find joy and strength that you are his? Take a moment to pray, to worship, and we'll close here in just a minute.